Welcome to your 2013 Legislative Breakfast. Chant. 
One chant when they were in front of the legislature, and you should know this. I was there listening to them. They reminded me of my mother. My mother and them were the same age. There were amazing women, strong women. And when they said very clearly, listen closely, we're here to speak for justice. We're here to speak for justice. On that philosophical foundation, one of the best and only in the whole United States Civil Rights Act of the Land of Development and Disabilities is in front of us. It takes every minute of every day to sustain it. That was the words they told us. Oh, congratulations on getting this act. Well, now the tough part is maintaining it and build upon it. Today, you're going to hear the reason why. We have past board members here. Cindy Coxett is, and I don't think I've seen her yet. Are you here? Um, well, here comes Harvey Wolf and his family. Right here. Thank you. Uh, Darcy, you here? Right up here. Uh, and Chris Peterson. Chris, you're right over there. Great color. Right over there. Great color. As I finish with their names, each of them are volunteers who are volunteers who dedicate hundreds of hours in the course of their duty to serve thousands and thousands of people, like all the others who preceded them. It's a great piece of public policy, and it takes all of us in this room to, to do it. Today with us, you're going to get a further introduction of, of other uh, folks. Um, it is um, Paul Fong, the Senator Paul Fong, who's going to talk to you. I'm going to the staff person, Sophia. Where are you, Sophia? Right here. It's good to see you. Member Richard Gordon, just saw him last night at the great event. Thank you very much. And, uh, I think um, representing uh, Bob Wisconsin, uh, Senator is uh, Sean Manon. Is uh, Sean, are you here? Okay. And then uh, certainly representing um, Senator Jerry Hill, Joshua Gross. Joshua's right there. There's over 400 people in this room, and I want to ask you that right now before I go to the next person to introduce, because I know they're interested. Uh, how many of you have been here for this breakfast for the first time? Raise your hand. Okay, everybody, remember their faces. We've got to go talk to them for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, Kansas City uh, City Council uh, member, District 4, is Kansas Shu. Where are you, Kansas, right there? Council member of Pete Constant. And number five, uh, Javier Campos. Thank you, John. Um, I think um, representing the Senate, I mean, this, I mean, he wants to be a Senator maybe sometime. Uh, Santa Clara Supervisor Ken Yeager. I believe Jim, uh, Jim Dale, are you right there? I don't know if we have a staff person from Joseph Williams' office. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you look at your program today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a young man, Francisco Valenzuela. Isn't that a beautiful name, Francisco Valenzuela? <laughs> uh, who, him and a lot of other volunteers have done an extraordinary job of putting these events on. He's going to come here now and uh, share with you some new program items. For those of you who don't know Santi, he's, he's not a shy guy. <laughs> but I have been, I've been in hundreds of meetings with him and he can't speak with his students, but he's got so much information that he just wants to share that with everyone. So. Uh, but he's got a, great, a lot of great stuff to share. I just want to say, welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Um, real, a quick disclaimer, for those of you who are getting my, my Barracuda emails, I am sorry, I'm sorry for all the... If you did, please, donate my card. Hopefully it's fixed. Uh, hope it's fixed. Um, but thank you for being here. Um, I want to welcome our providers, families, consumers, everyone, our elected officials here. 
Uh, each year, San Andreas hosts the breakfast to bring awareness to our service system, as well as hearing stories in, from our families. Um, each year, we get the opportunity of taking our stories to Sacramento. We meet with assembly members like Assembly Member Paul Fong and Rich Gordon, um, other staffers, um, senators, and tell them who we are, what we're doing, and remind them with this thing, maybe this year's thing, to remember me. And our hope is that they will remember us. Um, on March, oh my God, in March we went to Sacramento uh, for Grassroots Day. And Grassroots Day is hosted by the Association of Regional Center Agencies, where they invite all the regional centers throughout the state of California to attend and speak on behalf of their their uh, catchment areas, the group family members, providers, consumers. And this year at San Andreas, we probably have a large group, like we have about 40 people attending our Tuesday, state. And we met with our legislators, we met with some of the members of Paul Fong, we went to some of the members of Gordon's office. Um, and we had the opportunity to share with them uh, stories, challenges, but at the same time, even you know, people with disabilities, also the, the, the advances and, and the, the great things and quality of life that they have. But in order to have that quality of life, we need their support. So Grassroots Day allows us to take that message. And for those of you who went to Grassroots Day with us, thank you for being here, thank you for going with us. And the video that we're going to see captured a portion of our visits. Um, I want to thank Mike Nichols, he's our video guy, he did a great job uh, producing the video. We are at, at the ARCA Grassroot Days at the Capitol. Why are you here for Grassroot Days? This is uh, my second year here at, uh, to come for Grassroots Day. I really enjoyed it last year, uh, coming to uh, speak with the state senators and state assembly members, and I uh, learned a, lo a lot of interesting stuff uh, last year, and I'm hoping to learn more this year. Uh, what's more important about today? Well, today, what's really important about it, it's an opportunity for people to connect to their legislators. Sometimes it really helps for them to see the, the human side of what they deal with. I've been doing this approximately nine years now, but today is a very special day for me. My grandson has been diagnosed with speech delay. He's two and a half years old. He doesn't speak yet or anything. and. Now is the time to try to do whatever I can on a personal level now. Mark Stone, Assembly Member 29, District. This is my son, Joel. Um, he's 10 years old and he was, you know, struggles with autism. Uh, he was nonverbal for many years. He couldn't communicate tell me his needs or wants, I was basically how to mind read him. And um, we've struggled for years trying to get him services. And um, I don't know if you know how that feels when you have a child who cannot tell you how he feels or what happened in school, but it's, it's devastating. And because of the regional center, he was able to get earlier intervention services, as far as like speech therapy. And today he's able to communicate with me and talk in sentences. 
because of those early intervention services, um, it gave them a quality of life. If we don't recognize the cuts that happen and how that safety net is really frayed and the level of services are really frayed, that I think we do ourselves a great disservice as we try to understand what to do next. Thank you so much for listening to my story. Just remember Yoel and other children like him and parents like myself that um, need so many services to stay intact um, so that he can thrive and his potential can come out. So why is more important about helping the younger people? That with the budget cuts that have been happening, I think there's more acute awareness that it's our responsibility to stand up for folks who typically don't have a voice and aren't able to come and articulate their needs like you are here today. <laughs> so people with disabilities, our kids, our seniors, they need special attention and we need to make sure that we're there for them. It, do you feel honored? I am absolutely honored to be here. I'm excited. I walk into this building and you see the building. I walk up every morning and look up and think, wow, I get to work here. It's exciting. Um, how do you feel that uh, when I first voted you? <laughs> I, I can't be here without the good graces of the voters in, in the district. And, uh, I, it, it's a tremendous responsibility and I meet that responsibility with a great deal of pride. And, and I understand that I need to deliver it and be there for you. The Regional Center wants to present this to you uh, for your continued friendship, support, legislative leadership for individuals with developmental disabilities. And this is um, all for all your efforts and the support that we do receive and that we count on. Thank you. I, I'm a very strong supporter of the developmentally disabled community and uh, this really acknowledges that and I'm going to be showing it off. My name is Maya Bereket and I'm from Hope Services and I'm a, also a client advocate. And I feel great that I can actually have enough money to get my own apartment, so please, I am not a budget client. We look forward to seeing that money uh, being brought back to make the regional centers whole again, to make the providers whole again, and to bring lives whole again.
This good looking guy is, uh, sits on our service provider, is the chair of service provider advisory group, and they are themselves uh, very extraordinary advocates. And, and Wesley works for uh, Premier Healthcare Services, and he's going to uh, bring us through this great event. Thank you very much. Today, from being non-verbal to being verbal. 
So I cannot tell you how invaluable surgery is to my family. And also for my middle son. My middle son now is um, in a regular school and is a chatterbox, and now we cannot get him to be quiet. So um, I traveled to Grassroots Day um, in Sacramento. I have been in Washington, D.C., but the, Sa the Sacramento trip was very emotional for me because all I could think about the whole trip was thinking about how wonderful, what wonderful the San Andreas Regional Center has been how I cannot be without the San Andreas So it's so important to be an advocate, it's so important to be a voice to my son and also for myself. It's, um, you can't explain it. You can't explain it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry about my voice. So in sharing our stories, you're going to hear a lot of stories of different families of how the regional center has helped. But it's also good to remember what the regional center is about. It's about serving families. It's about serving children and adults and teenagers that will foster independence in their life. I know that Senate Drake's Regional Center will always be there for my son. And once he gets older, the services are going to be there for him. And how important it is to keep those services intact for families like myself. Um, so it's always good to remember what the Regional Center is about, what stories are about, and the, the individuals that San Andreas Regional Center serves. And also the importance of advocacy. I can't call, say that enough. So important to be a voice. And I thank you for being able to share my little story about my son and being a part of this great family here at San Andreas Regional Center. Thank you.
but uh, you know, you get, uh, uh, you get a lot of help, and uh, and uh, you know, it's one of those things where you just have to work at it and continue to contribute to uh, this great cause. And all of you also have a great social consciousness because you need to have that social consciousness. Most of you are sci social science experts because of your involvement with the disabled community. Because the uh, Diagnostic Disabilities Act was the first act that uh, uh, granted the state funds to uh, start these regional centers. And the American Disabilities Act was a civil rights uh, momentous occasion for the disabled community. And we support both. And uh, you're very fortunate to have legislators that understand that from this region. They all, they all have a social consciousness. They all put the developmentally disabled program as a priority. And as a result, when you get to May Revise, it's at least status quo. You will not see any more cuts. I know I can hear that. Although we need to work on restoring the cuts that we've done in the last four years, five years. When I first got on to the uh, assembly, I had to do a, a structural deficit cut of $42 billion. And of course, that impacted the developmentally disabled programs as well as every program uh, that we dealt with. And we had to cut $23 billion the second year and $21 billion the third year. And I've been cutting, cutting, cutting. And this is the first year that I'm not cutting anything. In fact, we're starting to look at restoring things. And so that's the great thing. And uh, I'm able to look at some positive uh, outcomes for our communities. And the developmentally disabled community is very high in our priorities as well. And so thank you for having me today. And uh, congratulations to all of you. Next up, we have another great supporter of our service system. He's a man about change. He's currently on the chair of the, he's currently the chair of the legislative LGBT caucus and a member of the environmental caucus as well. I had the pleasure of meeting him at last year's grassroots day. Please welcome Assembly Member Richard Gordon. Good morning. My uh, great colleague and friend, Paul Fong, brought us the good news that uh, because our economy is beginning to slowly grow and rebound, and because the citizens of California, in their wisdom, passed Prop 30 last year, there are no more cuts. The challenge will be to make sure that as we begin to look at restoring funds, we restore in the right place. And it is going to be imperative for all of us in this room to be advocates for the regional centers and for the developmentally disabled in our community. We need to make sure that everyone in Sacramento, not just Paul Fong and I, but the all 120 members of the state legislature get the message from their communities that this is our priority. This is what matters. The, uh, I, I think it's so clear the incredible progress we have made. But we cannot take any steps backwards. We've weathered a, a horrible storm of de de devastating budget cuts. We've ripped at the threads of the safety net. Now it's time to reweave that fabric and make it whole again. And it, your advocacy will be critical in doing that. Everyone is somebody. And we need to make sure that we take that message to Sacramento. Everyone deserves the right to have as much independence in their lives as they can. Everyone deserves to have 
the maximum opportunity to achieve their potential. Everyone needs to know that they are an important part of our community, whatever they are able to contribute. So there is much work for us to do. In many ways, our work is never, ever done. So your advocacy, your efforts, to continue to make sure that as the state of California rebounds, this community gets its share, gets its justice, is going to be important. There's work to do. Let's get at it. Thank you.
The rest of you service providers are in the same situation. Bless you, you are doing wonderful work, we appreciate it. And you know how hard it is to make, to keep, find and keep good staff in this valley on what we can afford to pay with, with all the challenges. Rent is what, $1,400 a month for a one member? How do you do that on 12 bucks an hour? We're, there's such a disparity. Um, the other thing is that I, what I wanted to share is that as a job developer, I work with clients who are also, their services are funded by the state of California through the Department of Rehab and of course we receive funding from both them and SARC. The difference that those services make in people's lives, probably a huge percentage of you have been unemployed at one point in your life. I know I've been unemployed at several. It profoundly impacts how I look at myself, how I feel at myself. I feel less than when I don't have a job, when I want to have a job. So do our clients. So do our people with disabilities. And without the services in place to help them find meaningful jobs in our community, not just in a movie theater, if that's not what they want. But I firmly believe that being fully integrated in our community means competitive employment and the chance at it. And that's not going to happen without adequate funding. That's not going to happen without advocacy. And I believe that the more we do get out into the community, the more that having somebody with a disability working next to you is typical, not unusual, what a better way to integrate into the community? What better way to really talk the talk and walk the walk of fully including members of society? And we all know what effect it is getting a paycheck and having a little extra money. Huge deal. And if we can give our clients, participants that want that, that opportunity, I think that's a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for your continuous advocacy. Next up, we have another great advocate. Her name is Maya, uh, Maya Berkev. Maya was born in Mountain View on June 13, 1981, and is the little child of Ruth and Noah. Both of Maya's parents knew she was special when she was just seven months old. She has been with the regional center since then. She graduated from Lindbrook High School in San Jose and the Foothill Transition to Work program in Los Altos. She finished with college and then started with Hope Services in 2001. She has been a Hope client for 12 years. She currently works for Hope as a management assistant and she is very proud of that. On top of that, she takes Danza classes at Hope Park Moor and volunteers with parents, helping parents. I don't know how she has time to do all that stuff. <laughs> she is a client advocate and enjoys going to the grassroots day every year in Sacramento to talk to her legislators. Please help me welcome Maya to the stage.
worker provides me with my job coaching, my outside job at Hope Las Colinas, as well as my Hope De Anza classes, poetry class, and action club that I am currently learning about leadership skills. My instructor, Monica, teaches me new skills in the computer, such as creating a PowerPoint, learning to use a memory stick, and making a cartoon of myself. In my poetry class, we learn how to express ourselves. If you go to www.youtube.com and look up George, Nim, and Red Beats, you will see a cartoon of one of our poems that we created in our class. We made a CD for children as well. We also have published a few poetry books from our poems. Last year, I was president of my action club and got to leave all the meetings. This wouldn't be possible without the funding from the regional center. Please help us by saving our funding. Remember me, it means that I count. Thank you, Maya. That was just as inspiring as last week. Next up, I hope you have your tissues ready, because I do. Um, our next speaker, her name is Michelle Alanis. Michelle is a proud mother of three and a proud new grandmother. Her son, Anthony Flores, is a client of San Andreas. Michelle's husband, Ben, has two adult, adult children with disabilities, and both are also clients of San Andreas. Michelle holds a bachelor's degree in business administration with a minor in psychology from San Jose State University and is a human resources professional with over 15 years of experience. Michelle also serves as a volunteer on the personnel committee for Housing Choices Coalition. Housing Choices Coalition assists individuals with developmental disabilities to find quality and affordable housing options. Please help me welcome Michelle to the stage. I am Anthony Forrest's mom and advocate. He has been a consumer of SAR for nearly eight years. He currently um, lives in Santa Cruz in a group home called Home Again. Um, Dr. Heidi Morgan he is a service provider, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, prior to SAR, um, I was a single mom, three children, um, and a son with disabilities. Um, I was going to college full time, working, and if that wasn't enough, I decided to be president of the Human Resources Association at San Jose State. So I was trying to be a single woman, um, carrying on by a single mom, going to college and working. And then things started changing. Um, I knew at a young age for my son that um, something was wrong. You know, he wasn't walking by a year, and a mom, a parent knows in your gut that something's not right. Um, I took him to his doctor. Um, they would tell me that, um, you know, he'll be fine. There's late walkers, and by 14 months, he's still not walking. And later, I just took him to Stanford. I didn't have the money, didn't have the means. I wanted a second opinion, and that's when he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. So certainly that's um, shocking to a parent, um, not knowing where to turn, what to do. So, you know, being super mom, just moving forward, doing everything on my own, trying to find the needs through my doctors, um, I knew something else was wrong. Um, and I understand, um, I could relate to Danette when she was mentioning about her um, son's meltdown going to the grocery store. Well, I decided to take my son, six years old, not only he had a disability, to Disneyland. I haven't been back since. He's 24. I knew I needed more help. Um, 
So what came to mind at our last meeting last week when I was sitting at the table is um, a book called Who Put My Cheese um, by Spencer Johnson. And this book is about four characters living in a maze, sniff and scurry, him and haw, who expected, um, experienced unexpected change in their life. Um, when they discovered that their cheese had disappeared. Um, each had and adapted differently to the change, and one, in fact, did not adapt at all. Because I was super mom, I was going to adapt. I was going to find out resources to help me and my son and his disabilities. I found out about Sark. I had no idea the services that they had to offer. So, the first thing that happened to me is that um, they had mentioned to me about um, events. One of them was the Special Olympics for Children. That event was very important to me because that's where I met my husband, who has two children with disabilities, if that wasn't enough. <laughs> so they did that home, and um, for parents that have children with disabilities who live at home, it's a challenge every day. Remind them to take a shower, to brush your teeth, to brush your hair. Oh, oh yeah, you have to get dressed and make the bus. So every day, that's what I face at home before I go to my full-time job. And sometimes we still get calls that we have to go to school for whatever reasons that are um, events that are happening in their lives. My caseworker was first Ruby Saunders. I don't know if she's here, but she was fantastic. Having a caseworker at SARC is like having your best friend alongside you. She attended my IEP meetings. Now I have a partner with me across the table when you're dealing with your school district. When my son was in high school, very difficult time. Can you imagine being in special ed class, knowing your comfort zone, and now you're in this huge high school with all these other people brings fear. He had a very difficult time. I didn't know that there was an off-campus high school. At that time, it was Beacon. I believe they're still around. That was a godsend. Then it was his post-senior program. Then the adult program, it was first Beyond Potential, it was fantastic, and then Bayside Reads currently in Santa Cruz. Not gonna cry, not gonna cry. <laughs> so I look at quality of life versus a closed institution. And I think that's the parents' fear. How much can we as parents help our children? How much support are we going to be able to obtain to help us along this journey, this unknown journey? Because we don't know the destination, because it's a moving target. You know, as I drive and I'm on the road, and I'm sure you all can see this as well. I see homeless people, some with disabilities walking on the street. And my fear is, I'm gone. Is that going to be my son? Who's going to take care of my son when I'm gone? The way that I take care of him, I know bathing him, his brush his teeth, take him for his haircuts, the way that he dresses, is important to me. The group home that he is living right now is a great team that collaborates with me. They know my expectations and they have met that and I know that he's taking care of where he is. But again, I think every parent's fear is who's going to take care of my child when you are gone? Is Clark still going to be there? We hope so. We need everybody in this room, whether you're a parent, um, service provider, to advocate for everybody. Because I think that although you don't have a child, you know somebody that has disabilities. We don't have 
enough luxury to watch TV. Let me tell you, I don't know how many shows my husband has recorded. I'm a season behind. What's it called? Time. I have no idea what's going on here. So I hear it's good. <laughs> the support and peace of mind and the team that I have advocating for my son is huge. I have two other children, adult children, and I know that it's affected them having a brother with disabilities. And I know that they will be there to help my son, but you know, they have their lives too. I want you to remember me, remember my story, remember those with disabilities, that you advocate and we can continue to make sure that Spark has the funding, continue to have some funding when we're gone. My son is not here today, he's in Santa Cruz, and um, you know, he was very moved the last time that I spoke. He said, Mom, you're a great speaker. And I said, I have no idea what I said. <laughs> but I hope that I touched your hearts and that you remember me and my story of remembrance. Thank you. Francisco back to the stage. He's going to show a video. Well, Wes is doing such a great job. This is the first time I see him in a suit. You look great. Yeah. Yeah. I graduated with us, brother. <laughs> <laughs> We're tied. Sharp. Um, how many of you are aware that the Children's Discovery Museum hosts the Play Your Way? Raise your hand if you've been there, you've heard about it. Um, last year, the Children's Discovery Museum reached out to us and asked us if we could help them promote a day where they recognize individuals with autism. You know, my, of course, I said yes, but then I also said, but we also serve other individuals, so we can't forget that we also serve people with developmental disabilities, autism, cerebral palsy, mental retardation, and other disabilities, and they said yes, we know. But, uh, last Saturday, they just, they just posted their third Play Your Way, where they invite families who have children with autism. And as you've heard, in that share, another family will share. It's not always easy to have a child with autism in a public setting. And so the Children's Discovery Museum opened their doors to those families. Um, we have a video that we, uh, we did, the second one they had. Uh, Mike came by and we did a great job. He did a great job in really identifying um, those families who could really tell their story. Um, but imagine a room with, I don't know, 300 families and they all brought their kids with autism or they were on the spectrum in one building. It wasn't quiet, but they were all having fun. <laughs> Santi would have really had fun in there. <laughs> I'm Jenny Martin. I'm the Director of Education at Children's Discovery Museum. This is my colleague. I'm Maureen Coulter. I'm the Executive Assistant here at the Discovery Museum and I'm also the Autism Initiative Coordinator. We're really pleased to be able to engage in a special initiative to support families with children on the autism spectrum. We have parent resources on our website. We've done some staff training with our staff to ensure that they are welcoming and understanding of families when they come here. And we also have special evening events called Play Your Way. The Play Your Way event is uh, designed especially for children with autism and their families um, in order to provide a welcoming environment so you know parents and kids can come here without feeling judged. They'll find families just like them. We invite organizations and service providers that serve children with autism um, to set up tables and provide information and talk to the parents. During the event, while the 
kids enjoy the museum. For families who have never come to the museum, it's a chance to see what the environment is like and to see whether or not they might be able and um, comfortable to come back during the day when we're open to the public also. Children's Discovery Museum is really a community resource for every family who comes here. The Play Your Way events and our Autism Initiative have been so wonderful for Children's Discovery Museum. The staff have learned so much. We are so appreciative of our partners who have helped us to learn. And we are so grateful to the families who have come and opened their hearts to the museum and to teaching staff here at the museum. We strongly urge other institutions, other agencies to engage in this kind of work for the community. It's so beneficial to everyone involved. It is waterproof. Play. Face. What do you want to play on your face? Do you want water? Do you want water? Okay. Tell us. Do you want water or sand? Where's the water? Because many of those opportunities 
opportunities weren't available to all people. This is only 44 years old. Only 44. I'm not going to ask those of you who are 44. <laughs> and I certainly won't ask all of you who are a little bit over 44. But I'm proud to have an AARP card. I am absolutely proud. <laughs> the important part is that this promise, this promise, requires the continuous investment of your time and effort. Through our great public elected officials, when they make the choice, they're going to serve the public. And everyone in this room can make the choice to serve yourself and your family. And that's what we're here to ask. As we close one of these events each time, we ask for that kind of commitment. The commitment in the heart of this Lantern Act. And it generalizes to all people. It's not exclusive. It's inclusive. There will be a time. There will be a time. Because it will be by our hands and our work that we only identify each other by our name. Are you ready for that time? I'm ready for that time. continuous advocacy and you are capable of doing it. So we always have one, one little, at the end of this, wake up call. Um, can you do this? Can you commit it? I know, that, I know this room is loaded with a whole lot of verbal people and I'm so <laughs> proud of you being so quiet for so long. Can you commit? Yes! Oh. Can you commit? Yes! Will you? Now. Yes. Now. Yes. Now. Yes. now. Now. Yes. 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 Now